So by my watch, it's 10 o'clock. Yes. So I'm going to go ahead and get started and welcome everybody to uh, our first session of the day, the 10 a.m. Time, time slot uh, for WP Campus Online 2019. Woo! Welcome, everybody. You are in room one. You may have stumbled in here accidentally because it was the first option, in which case we really hope that you will enjoy today's session, uh, which is... Uh, Sorry, customizing Gutenberg lessons learned at Georgetown, and your speaker this morning is Joni Hallaby from Georgetown University, um, and that is uh, what she's going to be talking to us about. We would like to take a quick moment to thank our camp captioning sponsor, uh, which we have for you today. You should be able to see your uh, captions down just below the uh, presentation, and that apologies got lots of stuff going on here. Um, yeah, lots of interruptions. Um, so we want to thank Pantheon very much, and we hope that you will enjoy the captioning. And um, please be mindful of the code of conduct. As Rachel mentioned in the opening remarks, if you see any issues, uh, please let her know or any one of the room moderators know, and we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, we'll address that as quickly as possible. Joni, please take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, welcome to Customizing Gutenberg, Lessons Learned at Georgetown. Um, my name is Joni Hallaby. I am a senior JavaScript developer at Georgetown University. Um, I've been working here for about three years now, just over three years. Um, and in my former life, I've worked as a developer kind of all over the place as uh, um, in small software companies in agencies. Uh, I've worked with a lot of CMSs, including WordPress. Um, and I'm very excited to speak with you today about uh, customizing the Gutenberg editor. Um, if you would like, you can follow along at your own pace um, online. I have my slides up online. I'll be flashing this website um, at the end of the talk as well. Um, so I work for an organization within Georgetown University called Web Services. And we are a small but very, very mighty team of project managers, product, a product manager, a designer, and developers. And we are basically, what do we do? Uh, we manage just about all of the websites at Georgetown University. We have uh, over 300 websites that encompass all of our schools, all of our departments, all of our units, which are those like little offices, like the, um, uh, we have the, the provost office and the, the president's office and uh, lots of different units. And also what we call top tier, which is what you get to when you go to www.georgetown.edu. And historically, we've um, managed all of these websites in a multi-site Drupal 7 environment. Um, and these sites use one of three themes, depending on what kind of site they are, if they're a school, if they're a department, or we have a special theme for top tier. Um, but our old theme code is old. It's been around for a really long time. It's kind of spaghetti, kind of what happens when you get to um, when you get to a point where you have an old site and you're just kind of updating, 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 the the code doesn't always stay as pretty as it did when you first uh, when you first created it. And in addition to that, we we launched a whole bunch of new uh, Drupal seven themes um, in 2016, but we very very quickly realized that Drupal seven end of life is coming. They're on Drupal eight right now. Um, and we really need to just update our sites, both in terms of the backend technology and also our themes. So we need to upgrade. And we had a lot of discussions about, all right, well, we're on Drupal 7. Should we stay on the Drupal train, go to Drupal 8? Or we started talking about WordPress. Um, and we kept debating back and forth, Drupal, WordPress, Drupal, WordPress. And we did a giant technical analysis, um, basically weighing the pros and cons of both of these systems. And as you might have guessed, we decided to go with WordPress. Um, there were lots of wins going with WordPress, uh, a much easier administrative UI. It was easier to maintain. and. Um, when we decided to go with WordPress, this was um, this is actually very very late in um, in 20, uh, uh, 2017. Um, 
Gutenberg was still this new, exciting, it was still in beta. Um, and it looked real pretty. It had a lot, it has a lot of potential. It had a lot of potential back then. It's um, it's this very new editor. And we decided, you know what? I think I think our content editors will really, really like working with WordPress, especially with Gutenberg. Um, so we decided to go with WordPress. Um, and I just, before I move on, I really just want to take a very quick vocabulary note. Um, Gutenberg threw out um, all of the pre-WordPress 5.0 life. Guten, the term Gutenberg was referred to as both the editor and the project of creating the editor. Um, but now, um, as I'm sure some of you are familiar, um, the WordPress core team is trying to decouple that um, because Gutenberg is now part of WordPress core as of 5.0. So the uh, the content editor is really just the editor and Gutenberg is now being referred to as the project of creating the editor. Um, but I am, I've been so used to calling Gutenberg both the project and the editor that I'm probably going to slip. Like I say, old habits die hard. So um, just bear with me with the terminology. Um, so, okay. Back to our decision to go to WordPress. We made this decision, so now, now what do we do? Um, we had a lot of content goals going into our project because we really wanted to make full use of Gutenberg. Our content editors are, um, we have a lot of very active content editors on some of our sites and they like to do very creative things. Um, they want to make their, their content pop. They want to make their content look different and unique. Um, so we thought, okay, Gutenberg is a really good way of doing that because there's lots of different options that you can use in Gutenberg. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that all of these Gutenberg blocks, all of the different options that you have in the editor are accessible um, in terms of WCAG accessibility. Um, so we wanted to make sure that everything was usable and accessible, but we also wanted to support all of the content needs and the expectations of our content editors at Georgetown. So the first step in trying to figure out, okay, well, what do we need is we really needed to get to know the Gutenberg editor. Um, so taking a look at the editor, this is a basic screenshot of what the content editor looks like. Um, and there's a few different uh, main points on here. So a block is just a single element in the user interface. So that could be a paragraph, a header, an image, um, a table. Um, the toolbar sits above each block, and each block can have that toolbar that can include things like font options, alignments, um, uh, media options, uh, any sort of user interface piece of functionality that could apply to a specific block. So for example, like a paragraph, you would have options to bold, italicize, um, underline, strike through, things like that. And then we have the inspector panel, and this is also called the block panel, and that's that panel that appears on the right-hand side of the editor when a block is active that gives you a whole bunch of more options. So, um, for example, you can add uh, classes, you can select maybe custom colors or add a link, things like that. Um, a lot of the options in this inspector panel depend on what block you've chosen. Um, and Gutenberg comes with a bunch of uh, just out of the box core editor blocks that can be selected from the block selector. So this is a screenshot of part of the block selector, and there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of different uh, custom uh, sorry out of the box uh, blocks like paragraph header and line list. Um, that you can see here, and they're all uh, divided up into different categories. So there's common blocks, but they, there are also a bunch of layout blocks or embed blocks so you can embed um, things like YouTube, Vimeo, um, uh, Facebook, things, um, and content like that. So step two, we know what our editor looks like. We can see the giant list of core out of the box blocks that Gutenberg comes with. So step two is really the question, do these core blocks cover everything that we need and what our content editors are expecting out of their, um, um, out of their website? So we decided to do a content audit. 
Um, and this basically involved looking at all of um, all of our websites, or a good chunk of our websites, and seeing what con what kinds of content our editors are using, and correlating those types of content um, with the set of out of the box blocks uh, that Gutenberg comes with. And we decided to separate uh, all of these pieces of content into three categories: blocks we can definitely use. Um, blocks we can't use in Gutenberg for whatever reason, and a lot of these reasons actually ended up being accessibility reasons. Um, so for example, um, the out-of-the-box Gutenberg table isn't really fully accessible. Uh, the cover block can, a little hit or miss, um, that one's actually up for debate right now. A cover block can, be, can look amazing, but can also be really horribly inaccessible, um, depending on what picture and what font color we're using. Um, and then we were looking at blocks that we need but don't exist. So what do I mean by that? Um, so taking a look at our, our websites, we have a lot of websites that just look very, very basic and have very, um, very common pieces of content like headings and paragraphs and images or lists. Um, but then we have pages that look like this um, or look like this. And these are, these are pieces of content um, that our editors in Drupal uh, created to make the websites look more interesting and uh, just more visually appealing, but they're not exactly standard pieces of content. These, um, so we, we actually call these, uh, uh, these square kinds of things. They're, they're actually clickable on our websites. Um, we call these cards. Um, and they're basically blocks of little snippets of content that can include an image like this or um, a header and a paragraph of description and a, a call to action link. Um, each of these cards can have a can have slightly different pieces of content. And usually these cards, usually our editors want to have sites that um, have a bunch of these cards all in one block. So one of these little boxes we consider to be a card, but the whole set, like all four of these cards, we consider to be a card deck. Um, and this is something that is a very useful piece of uh, content for our content editors, but it's not something that is included in Gutenberg. Um, so it brings me to step three. We need to make some custom blocks because our content editors are expecting these pieces of content like these cards and these card decks, but they don't exist in Gutenberg, so we have to build them ourselves. Um, so we went through a development phase that was basically most of 2018, um, where we worked off of this list of blocks that we need but don't actually exist in the, the Gutenberg editor. Um, and we started in um, early last year, and we're, we're pretty much done adding all of the custom uh, custom Gutenberg blocks that we need, but we're still, we still might add one or two. We're definitely tweaking a lot of the blocks that we've created, and we've learned a ton over the past year going through this development phase of creating our own um, editor blocks. Um, and the first lesson that I learned personally was that if you're going to be working with Gutenberg, and especially if you're going to be extending Gutenberg and customizing it, you really need to know React, uh, which I actually did not know before I started on this journey. Um, but knowing React is very important because Gutenberg is written in React. Um, so knowing how React.js works, um, having created, uh, any sort of application in React, that will actually help you a lot. It's not a requirement because like I said, I didn't know React when I first uh, started customizing Gutenberg and I am writing all sorts of blocks now. So you can, you can definitely learn on the go, but it'll make your life easier if you already know React. Um, so you should know React, but you're also really dealing with the Gutenberg API. Um, so you're not actually writing a pure React application. You're really writing customizations based on the Gutenberg API. Um, that being said, creating a new block is actually pretty simple. You need to know a little bit of PHP, um, but most of the work, because this is a React application, um, most of the work is handled in the JavaScript. So if I were to create just a very, very basic uh, Gutenberg 
uh, custom block. This is all the PHP I would need. Um, and all this PHP is doing is basically adding the JavaScript that you're going to write to the WordPress environment. Um, so I'm just using the regular WP MQ script, grabbing my um, JavaScript file. I'm declaring a couple of dependencies that I'm going to need. And these are uh, WP blocks and WP components are actually Gutenberg packages. We'll take a look at those a little bit later. And that's all I'm doing. Uh, all the PHP is doing is enqueuing our, our JavaScript. Um, so like I said, the heavy lifting is really in the JavaScript itself. And the if you're creating a new Gutenberg block, uh, the register block type function will become your best friend. Uh, what I have here on the screen is actually a shell of what you would write to create a brand new Gutenberg block. So the first thing that you would need is a just a custom, uh, a custom block handle. Um, so we at Georgetown, we're prefacing all of, our, um, all of our block handles with GU for Georgetown University. And then um, we're naming our blocks based on whatever that the block happens to be doing. These handles have to be unique, kind of like variable names, they have to be unique. Um, and following that, you want to create a title for your block. So the title of the block um, is using this title attribute. And this title appears is, is the piece of uh, text that appears in the block selector. Um, so when you're looking for a new block to add to your page, um, this title is what's going to show up in the block selector. So it's really your best bet to keep it short, maybe one or two words. Honestly, title of the block that I have on the screen is probably too long. Um, so you really want to keep this short and sweet. You can also add a description um, for the block. And you can be a little bit more verbose here. This description is a block of text that will appear in the inspector panel um, when the block is active in your edit screen. So after you add a block, um, it's on your edit screen, you click on it to start editing that block, that description will appear just below the title in the inspector panel on the right. Um, you can also designate a category for your block to be categorized inside the block selector. Um, so there's a whole bunch of out-of-the-box categories, like I mentioned before. So you have common, layout, embed, um, formatting. But you can, also, um, you can also create your own categories. This wasn't always true. Um, if you've worked with Gutenberg before, you, before um, maybe like six months ago, you were actually um, restricted to just the set of out-of-the-box categories. But now, if you type in a category uh, cats, you will it'll just automatically create a new category for you. And so you can define your own categories if you have a lot of blocks that don't quite fit into those out-of-the-box categories. Um, you can also define the icon that appears in the block selector. Um, it also actually appears in the um, in the toolbar of the block when, when you have it selected in the edit screen. Um, you can define this icon to be either a dash icon, um, which you can just go grab and put the name in here. Um, or you can actually define your own custom SVG icons if you want a little bit more control of what these icons look like. You can just put an, um, you can put an SVG object um, as, the, um, as the value for this icon parameter. Um, and you can also define keywords. So these keywords are kind of like SEO keywords for your website, um, but they're they're really used um, inside the selector search box. So if you have a giant, giant list of, it's already a pretty giant list of blocks that are in the block selector, um, and you just want to type in, like, I know I want to look for a news block, you can just start typing in um, keywords, and the selector search box will find the blocks based on either the block title or any of these keywords. Um, you do have a hard limit of three. Uh, the editor will yell at you if you put in more than three. Um, so definitely keep it to three or less if you want to add any keywords. Keywords are optional. Um, so if you don't feel the need to have any keywords, you don't have to put them in there. Um, now we're getting to the juicy stuff. So um, attributes is... Um, um, attributes is an object that's inside of our, our, our registration function that um, this is uh, this defines the data that we have saved for the block. 
so for example, if I want to create just like a hello world block, so a block that's gonna just say hello and then spit out whatever name I give it, I really only need one piece of information here. I really just need a name and I can set a default value to be anything I want. So right now I just have it set to be a blank, um, a blank string. But if I wanted to say, all right, you know what? I want the default to be world. So by default, if I don't put in a name, my block will just spit out hello world. I can do that. Um, I can also add as many attributes as I want here. So if I have a lot of different things going on, um, so if I want to have like a name and a title, if I want to create a profile block, for example, uh, a name, a title, a description, I can just add as many attributes as I want here. And these attributes uh, are saved into my block through an edit function. And this edit function is one of two required functions for block registration. So the edit function defines the both the UI displayed in the block editor, but it also defines how any content that uh, um, that an, a person adds to the block, it defines how that is saved and what this content is saved um, or which uh, which attribute is saved to which piece of content in my edit screen. Um, and so this is basically what my edit function looks like. So I'm getting. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is get all of my attributes. So I'm just getting my my one attribute in this example um, from the props uh, variable. Um, here I'm defining what happens. I'm, I'm defining a function um, for what happens when this variable gets changed. So I'm basically saying, all right, well, when my name is changed, I'm going to take in the value of whatever uh, the content editor types into this block. And I'm going to say, I want to set attributes. I want to set my attribute called name to this value that's being passed in. And then I am returning um, just a bunch of JSX. So I want to um, uh, put all of this content into an H1. I'm saying hello. And then I have a component called a text control. Um, and this text control is basically just giving me a very basic uh, text input box where I can add um, I can add my name that um, that will go into this name attribute. So text control takes a bunch of different parameters. I can specify a tag name. Um, this is just any HTML tag that I want. Um, I have it set to span right now. I can set a placeholder just like any other input. Um, I'm telling this text control that the value is going to be whatever is in my name attribute. And then whenever the content in this um, in this text input changes, my on change events is going to call my on change name function that's defined up here. Um, the second required function that I need is a save function. Um, so the save function just defines the UI that is displayed on the front end. So when you go to publish or update your page and you go and view your page, this save function defines what is displayed when I'm actually looking at my page as a front end user. And the save function, very similarly to um, my edit function, uh, grabs all of my attributes from my properties value. Uh, variable, um, and then it returns the front on HTML. So in this case, it's just returning. Um, I have um, I have this using JSX here. It's returning my contents inside an H1. I'm saying hello, and then I'm grabbing the value of my name variable. And that's it. That's the very very basic overview of uh, registering a block. Um, so once I have that down, my second lesson is really, really, really getting to know the Gutenberg API because it really will be your new best friend, especially if you're creating more complex uh, Gutenberg blocks. So the Gutenberg uh, GitHub is a great, great resource for getting to know the API. Um, it looks big and scary and complicated at first, but you really get to know it very quickly. Um, the first thing you really need to know about how um, uh, the Gutenberg project is set up in GitHub is everything is divided into packages. Um, there is some central documentation in a docs folder, but most of the documentation, most of the really detailed documentation about a particular component or feature or function 
actually exists in a readme file within each package. So you actually really do need to know where to look um, if you're looking for something super hyper specific. Um, so this is just a screenshot of uh, the Gutenberg GitHub main page. Um, I basically live here uh, when I'm doing development because there's so much information in here. And most of this information is in this packages folder. Um, and the packages folder has a lot of different, um, uh, a lot of different subfolders. Uh, the components and the editor folder inside packages are the two that I find the most useful. So all of the UI elements that can be added to a custom block um, are called components, and there's basically two big lists of components. There's general, there's general components um, that are in the components folder, and then there's um, there are specific editor components that are in the editors directory. Um, so one example of a very, very well documented component is actually a drop-down menu that happens to be in the components directory. So if I go and I check this out. I can see I can see all of the the JavaScript, the styles, and even uh, the development tests that they have written for each component. Actually, each component has a test directory just like this. It's actually really useful in trying to figure out if you're trying to figure out how a component works. It's actually really useful to take a look at those tests. Um, but a lot of these components have very detailed documentation in the README for um, for that particular component, and that's why I was saying it's it's so. Um, it's so important to actually kind of deep dive into all of the components and take a look at each folder because not only will you see the code itself, but a lot of these have these very detailed readme. So I can see this drop down menu. Um, I can see exactly what it looks like. There's a bunch of guidelines for both design and development. Um, so I can see, okay, this drop down menu is giving me a drop down menu. Um, and just kind of taking a look through all of these design guidelines, um, it, it gives you, uh, this particular component gives you hints about when it's appropriate to use a drop down menu, um, when it's not appropriate to use a drop down menu. Um, and also, this is the part that I find mo the most useful these development guidelines, um, because the development guidelines will always have this usage section where I can see an example of how, um, how to define a drop down menu. So I can see, okay, well, this, this drop down menu, um, I can define an icon, I can define a label, and it has all these controls. And I can, it looks like I can add as many controls as I want. Um, and each of these controls has its own attributes and um, on click functionality. And, it, um, and then I can see a definition of all of the properties below. Um, and a lot of these, um, not, not all of the components, but a lot of the components in the Gutenberg project have a fleshed out readme file like this. So it's, it's really great to just sort of dig into the GitHub. If you do come across a component, and I have come across components that don't have a readme or have very little in the readme, you can always click into the JavaScript and just look through the JavaScript and um, figure out how a component works. A lot of them um, have comments, some don't. This is actually a little bit less commented than, than some other ones, but um, the JavaScript is also a really great resource if you're really trying to figure out like, oh, there's this component that sounds really interesting, but there's no documentation. Just take a look at the JavaScript. Um, so, um, also in packages, there is a blocks directory that has all of the code for block registration, block deprecation. So if you if you write a block, deprecation is basically if you write a block and then you decide to change the block or remove the block, um, uh, deprecation gives you uh, a, a lot of the code that you need to maintain backwards compatibility. If you created a block and then users are using it and then all of a sudden you have to take that functionality away, um, deprecation allows you to um, basically have backwards compatibility so the editor doesn't colossally break. Um, so um, the blocks directory under packages has all of the code for block deprec uh, deprecation, registration, um, extensibility. So you can take a look at the code. There's no real documentation in this particular folder, but 
Um, there is a developer handbook in the docs folder. The docs folder is um, also under packages. And there's a lot of, um, I'll open this one too, there's a lot of great actual documentation in readme files here. Um, so the main readme file kind of gives you a, a, a basic overview of extending blocks, um, basically summarizing extending blocks, extending the editor UI, how to deal with meta boxes. Um, but again, you, if you want to know more about the block API, you kind of want to do, you, you want to dive into the block API folder, and then you can read all of the readmes about um, block deprecation, block registration, for example. Um, and these, these readmes are very, very well done. Um, and you can see, okay, well, these are all the different functions that can, um, and how to, um, it, it, it will list all of the different functions and all of the different attributes under each function. So you know exactly what you're getting into in terms of block registration um, or any other sort of block functionality. Um, also, if you're really stuck or if you just want, um, like me, I love seeing real world examples of how a component is used, how a component is coded. You can also take a look at all of the core block code. Um, so if you want to see, you know what, I really like how the list block was coded and I want to write something very similar to that, you can go into under packages, there's a block library. Um, and there's a block library folder and that has a lot of really great um there's a, there's a lot of documentation in there but there's also like all of the code for all of the out of the box blocks so you could take a look at that and just dissect how one of the out of the box blocks is is coded and use that in your own uh code if that seems appropriate um so my third takeaway from all of this block uh block creation work that we've been doing is fancy stuff really isn't that hard either. So creating creating just a regular, very simple block is pretty easy, but doing something that's a little bit fancier, it takes more work, but it's not impossible. Um, so if you remember our cards from way back many slides ago from our content audit, um, these are our cards. Um, we have cards that have, each individual card has its own, um, bits of content. So for example, each of these cards has an image and it has a, a call to action link and it has button, uh, some, a bunch of text in this button, in this call to action button. But a card deck on a whole is one giant block. We, we at Georgetown treat these card decks as one giant block that has all of these little individual card blocks inside of it. So, that really lends itself to something called nested blocks. So Gutenberg allows you to nest um, blocks inside of each other. So blocks can have a parent-child relationship. So I can have a content block inside a content block. And to do this, um, to create custom nested blocks, it's really just like creating a regular block. But now I need to create two blocks. So for my card deck example, I need to create both the child block for the individual card, but I also need to create a separate block for the parent that will house my card deck. So this parent block is basically the shelf that the shell that's going to hold all of my um, all of my child blocks, all of my individual cards in this example. Um, so this is basically what my card deck looks like. Um, so we call this card um, the one with the image in the background. We actually call it an image overlay card. Um, so this um, this parent uh, this parent image overlay card deck block um, allows me to select a bunch of different options for the card deck as a whole. So I can say, okay, well, how many cards do I want to display per row? I want these cards floating kind of next to each other on large screens. Um, also, I want to be able to choose like the different um, positions where the button can go. So it can go up here in the top left, or maybe I want it down here in the bottom right. Um, and the parent, this parent block, it has its own attributes to house all of those options that I have in the inspector panel. So where the button's going to go, where the um, um, uh, how many blocks I, how many cards I want to display per row, um, 
And this parent block, the card deck block, is registered just like any other block, um, but it can allow child blocks to be added inside of it. And I can either say, I want this parent to have every block that's available to me in the Gutenberg editor, or I can lock it down and say, you know what? The only appropriate block that my, my card deck parent block is allowed to have inside of it is just a card. And I can really lock it down and say, I only want image overlay cards to be in my image overlay deck. Um, and these children can be literally any block. Um, it can be an out-of-the-box block. So I, I could also say, you know what, I also want paragraphs to get thrown in here too. Or it can be my custom card block. Um, and this is, um, instead of the edit uh, function that I showed you earlier for just a regular block, this is basically the edit function that we're using for a parent block. So I have my properties um, variable that I'm passing in, but I'm not really using it. Um, I'm using it for some of the options, but the um, the biggest change in here is I'm also having, uh, I'm also defining this allowed blocks variable that is an array of all of the blocks um, that are allowed to be in this particular parent uh, block. So this particular parent block, I'm only allowing one, um, uh, one child block to be added to it, and that is my um, my image overlay child, which is the just the individual card block. Um, so this array takes all of the handles for whatever blocks you want. And like I said, you can have your own custom, you can list your own custom blocks in here, or you can list some of the Gutenberg out of the box uh, blocks as well. Um, and I'm also defining uh, cards, but basically what I'm calling a, a cards template. So this is the template that the parent block uses to initialize itself and say, um, um, what this parent block is going to look like when somebody initially adds this parent block to the editor. Um, so I'm basically just saying, all right, whatever quantity of, um, of child blocks I want in here, I am going to return that number of child blocks um, and just display that number of child blocks in my parent block when my parent block is initially added to the editor. Um, and then my return function is basically just calling this template and it's saying, you know what, initially, I only want three of these child blocks in my card deck. Um, and I am only allowing my allowed blocks that I'm defining up here. And the child block, just like I said before, just a regular, regular child block. Uh, this can be any block, you define this just as you would any other block in your system. So it has its own attributes. It's no different than any other block. Um, the, last, uh, the last lesson is really know what you want or be OK with refactoring your blocks. Um, so seriously, either is fine. Um, when we started out on this project, we didn't exactly know what we wanted. Um, we knew what kinds of content we needed to add to our Gutenberg editor, but we weren't entirely sure what the best way of presenting it in the admin UI. because. There are so many component options that Gutenberg offers that um, it's kind of like going to a diner and you get that giant menu of like 50 pages and you just don't know what you want. So you try something and then maybe next time you try something else. So we did a lot of agile design and design and design. We're kind of, we're, st we're still doing that for a lot of our blocks. So the corollary lesson to is let your users play with your blocks. Um, so we put a lot of a lot of the work that we've been doing in WordPress in front of real users. We've been letting users migrate their sites into WordPress, and we got a ton of feedback. And based on that feedback, we decided to refactor some of our more complex blocks, like card decks, because they're kind of complicated. So going back to these card decks, um, we were initially editing, uh, had all of our editing options in line inside the block. Um, and it actually bloated our block, and it made editing a little bit awkward. Um, and we decided, you know what, components could go inside um, the block editor, but we could also just put them in the inspector panel, get them out of the way, and let the editor just show the end result. Um, so before, we had this, um, this card deck, and inside each card, you had to click on the button and then 
add a link down here. And it wasn't entirely intuitive. Like you have to go up here and look at these really cryptic icons to figure out how to change the background image. Um, but after we moved everything into the inspector panel over to the right, and we made everything very, very clear. Um, I can see exactly where my link options are, my button text, my URL, how to change the image for the uh, for each card. And we think it's gonna make, we actually just implemented this change. We think it's gonna make life um, a lot easier for our content editors, hopefully. Um, so in summary, um, life with creating um, custom, Gutenberg uh, blocks or extending Gutenberg blocks. It'll be much easier if you already know React.js. If you don't, it will be okay. You will learn it, <laughs> I promise you. Um, but it will be easier if you already know React. Um, definitely get to know the Gutenberg GitHub API. It will become your best friend. Um, figure out what you really need. Um, if you don't know, use an agile approach and just be flexible. Um, and be okay with refactoring. If something really isn't working, just be okay with saying, you know what, this isn't working, we're gonna just try something else. Again, it goes back to being agile. And lastly, breathe. Um, Gutenberg is big and it's complicated and it's new and there's a lot going on with it and a lot can be better, but it, there's a lot of really good stuff in there and you can create a lot of really good stuff um, in there. Um, you can be very, very innovative with creating these Gutenberg blocks. Um, so just breathe, be patient. It's a learning curve, but um, it's definitely worth it. And it's, I have to say this past year has been a lot of fun. And that's it. Thank you so much. Um, if, again, if anybody wants uh, to take a look at the slides, my slides are available online. You can email me, you can tweet at me, um, and definitely feel free to ask me questions um, after this, um, uh, after this session, I will be on Slack all day. Thank you again so much. Joni, thank you. Uh, I, I know I'm not the only one who found that absolutely uh, fascinating. Thank you so much for doing that talk. We don't have very much time for questions, but there were a few in the chat. So I'm just gonna uh, quickly, you did a, a great job of recapping how you built the cards and that was fascinating that you did refactor them and, and make them nested. Um, that, that's a really great example. Can you sort of address, did you guys choose to build these uh, blocks as, a, a, as their own plugin or did you include this in a theme that you guys have for campus? Uh, we actually, they're all implemented in their own plugin. So each one's an individual plugin. Uh, no, actually, we have um, one. We have one very large plugin um, that includes all of our custom Gutenberg blocks. I'm about to probably in the next couple of weeks uh, refactor that plugin to be a little bit nicer because it's we've added so many blocks over the course of the past year. It actually ended up being a little bit spaghetti. So I want to go back and clean that up. I haven't really thought about pulling each one out into its own plugin. That's an interesting idea. But right now they're all in one giant um, Georgetown custom Gutenberg blocks plugin. So interestingly, NC State, we have also created our own blocks plugin. So yeah, we should definitely hang out. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, for sure. So yeah, that's good to know. Um, there were other questions that came into the chat, uh, including some, some generalized Gutenberg or block editor questions, like how uh, difficult is it to switch back and forth between the block editor and the classic editor? Do you, I don't know if you want to address that, if you've spent a lot of time trying to address those problems so far, or if that hasn't been a big issue yet. Ah, that really hasn't been a big issue yet um, because we're really we're really trying to steer our content editors to use Gutenberg. Um, we're actually trying to get them away from the the classic editor because in the classic editor you have very very easy access to the HTML, and um, that's something that we also had in our Drupal environment. And we really don't want people to um, mess around with the HTML just because it causes a lot of issues in terms of uh, like visual identity issues, accessibility issues. Uh, just generally breaking their website issues. Um, yeah. So we really want to steer clear from that. We too have sort of tried to do more of a hard shift so that you're not going back and forth, right? So like for yeah. our new users, they are going into the block editor right away. And then the old users that are in the classic editor, they'll be transitioned to the new editor, to the block editor, and then there's no real going back and forth. So for we haven't seen too much of that. But I encourage you guys to chat more about this if you want in the attendees online channel. Um, I hope all of you will join me in thanking Joni for a great talk and um, continue chatting about this online. And uh, thanks again to Panthe 
Pantheon, our captioning sponsor, and we hope to see you guys in another 13 minutes for the next session. Joni, thanks again. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.